I was going to do this anyways, but every time somebody comments some bullshit, I'm going to record another chapter. So, here is chapter 2 of Ilan Papis, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, written 2007, reprinted 2008, 9, 11, and read in 2024. This ended up being a longer chapter than I was expecting, and so I'm going to have to split it into two parts, but um, this is going to be the first part of chapter 2. The Drive for an Exclusively Jewish State The United Nations General Assembly strongly rejects policies and ideologies aimed at promoting ethnic cleansing in any form. Resolution 4780, 16th December, 1992 Zionism's Ideological Motivation Zionism emerged in the late 1880s in Central and Eastern Europe as a national revival movement, prompted by the growing pressure on Jews in those regions either to assimilate totally or risk continuing persecution. Though, as we know, even complete assimilation was no safeguard against annihilation in the case of Nazi Germany. By the beginning of the 20th century, most of the leaders of the Zionist movement associated this national revival with the colonization of Palestine. Others, especially the founder of the movement, Theodore Herzl, were more ambivalent, but after his death in 1904, the orientation towards Palestine was fixed and consensual. Eretz Israel, the name for Palestine in the Jewish religion, had been revered throughout the centuries by generations of Jews as a place for holy pilgrimage, never as a future secular state. Jewish tradition and religion clearly instruct Jews to await the coming of the promised Messiah at, quote, the end of times, unquote, before they can return to Eretz Israel as a sovereign people in a Jewish theocracy, that is, as the obedient servants of God. This is why today several streams of ultra-Orthodox Jews are either non- or anti-Zionist. In other words, Zionism secularized and nationalized Judaism. To bring their project to fruition, the Zionist thinkers claimed the biblical territory and recreated, indeed, reinvented it as the cradle of their new nationalist movement. As they saw it, Palestine was occupied by quote-unquote strangers and had to be repossessed. Strangers here meant everyone not Jewish who had been living in Palestine since the Roman period. In fact, for many Zionists, Palestine was not even an occupied land when they first arrived there in 1882, but rather an quote-unquote empty one. The native Palestinians who lived there were largely invisible to them, or if not, were part of nature's hardship and as such were to be conquered and removed. Nothing, neither rocks nor Palestinians, was to stand in the way of the national quote-unquote redemption of the land the Zionist movement coveted. Until the occupation of Palestine by Britain in 1918, Zionism was a blend of nationalist ideology and colonialist practice. It was limited in scope. Zionists made up no more than 5% of the country's overall population at that time. Living in colonies, they did not affect, nor were they particularly noticed by the local population. The potential for a future Jewish takeover of the country and the expulsion of the indigenous Palestinian people which historians have so clearly recognized in retrospect in the writings of the founding fathers of Zionism, became evident to some Palestinian leaders even before the First World War. Others were less interested in the movement. Historical evidence shows that at some time between 1905 and 1910, several Palestinian leaders discussed Zionism as a political movement aiming to purchase land, assets, and power in Palestine although the destructive potential was not fully comprehended at that period. Many members of the local elite saw it as part of the European missionary and colonialist drive, which in part it was, but of course it had an additional edge to it that turned into a dangerous enterprise for the native population. This potential was not often discussed or articulated by the Zionist leaders themselves, but some Palestinian notables and intellectuals must have sensed the looming danger since we find them trying to convince the Ottoman government in Istanbul to limit, if not totally prohibit, Jewish immigration and settlement into Palestine, which was under Turkish rule until 1918. The Palestinian member of the Ottoman parliament, Said al-Husayni, 
claimed on the 6th of May 1911 that, quote, the Jews intend to create a state in the area that will include Palestine, Syria, and Iraq, unquote. However, al Husayni belonged to a family and a group of local notables who until the 1930s preached against the Zionist colonization while selling lands to the newcomers. As the mandatory years went by, the sense of a looming danger, indeed a catastrophe, settled in among the more intellectual sections of the elite, but it was never translated into proper preparations for the existential danger awaiting their society. Others around Palestine, such as the leading Egyptian literati, saw the movement of Jews into Palestine as an irresponsible attempt on the part of Europe to transfer its poorest and often stateless people into the country, not as part of a master plan aimed at the dispossession of the local people. To them, this movement of wretched people seemed but a minor threat compared with the far more conspicuous attempt European colonial powers and churches were making to take over the quote-unquote holy land through their missionaries, diplomats, and colonies. Indeed, prior to the British occupation of Palestine at the end of 1917, the Zionists were vague where their actual plans were concerned, not so much for lack of orientation, but more because of the need to prioritize the concerns of the as-yet small Jewish immigrant community. There was always the threat of being thrown out again by the government in Istanbul. However, when a clearer vision for the future needed to be spelled out for internal consumption, we find no ambiguity whatsoever. What the Zionists anticipated was the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine in order to escape a history of persecutions and pogroms in the West, invoking the religious quote-unquote redemption of a quote-unquote ancient homeland as their means. This was the official narrative, and it no doubt genuinely expressed the motivation of most of the Zionist leadership's members. But the more critical view today sees the Zionist drive to settle in Palestine instead of other possible locations as closely interwoven with 19th century Christian millenarianism and European colonialism. The various Protestant missionary societies and the governments in the European concert competed amongst themselves over the future of a quote-unquote Christian Palestine that they wanted to pry away from the Ottoman Empire. The more religious among the aspirants in the West regarded the return of the Jews to Palestine as a chapter in the divine scheme, precipitating the second coming of Christ and the creation of a pietist state there. This religious zeal inspired pious politicians such as Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister during the First World War, to act with even greater commitment for the success of the Zionist project. This did not prevent him from supplying his government at the same time with a host of quote-unquote strategic rather than messianic considerations for why Palestine should be colonized by the Zionist movement, which were mostly infused by his own overriding distrust of and disdain for Arabs and Mohammedans, as he called the Palestinians. Recent scholarship also tends to question the more Marxist flavor that the official Israeli historiography has claimed for the early colonization of Palestine by portraying Zionism as a positive endeavor to carry the socialist and Marxist revolutions beyond their less successful attempts in Russia. The more critical view depicts this aspiration as doubtful at best and as manipulative at worst. And as manipulative at worst. Indeed, much like today's more liberal-minded Israeli Jews who are ready to drop the principles of democracy when faced with the prospect of a demographic majority of non-Jews in the country, so, it seems, did the socialist Zionists quickly substitute their more universal dreams with the powerful allure of nationalism. And when the main objective became making Palestine exclusively Jewish rather than socialist, it was significantly the labor movement within Zionism that instituted and implemented the ethnic cleansing of the local population. The early Zionist settlers directed most of their energy and resources towards buying up plots of land in an attempt to enter the local labor market and create social and communal networks that could sustain their as yet small and economically vulnerable group of newcomers. The more precise strategies of how best to take over Palestine as a whole and create a nation-state in the country, or in part of it, were a later development, closely associated with British ideas of how best to solve the conflict Britain itself had done so much to exacerbate. 
The moment British Foreign Secretary Lord Balfour gave the Zionist movement his promise in 1917 to establish a national home for the Jews in Palestine, he opened the door to the endless conflict that would soon engulf the country and its people. In the pledge he made in his government's name, Balfour promised to protect the aspirations of the non-Jewish population. A strange reference to the vast native majority, but the declaration clashed precipitately with both the aspirations and natural rights of the Palestinians for nationhood and independence. By the end of the 1920s, it was clear that this proposal had a potentially violent core, as it had already claimed the lives of hundreds of Palestinians and Jews. This now prompted the British to make a serious, albeit reluctant, attempt to solve the smoldering conflict. Until 1928, the British government had treated Palestine as a state, within the British sphere of influence, not as a colony, a state in which, under British tutelage, the promise to the Jews and the aspirations of the Palestinians could both be fulfilled. They tried to put in place a political structure that would represent both communities on an equal footing in the state's parliament as well as in government. In practice, when the offer was made, it was less equitable. It advantaged the Zionist colonies and discriminated against the Palestinian majority. The balance within the new proposed legislative council was in favor of the Jewish community who were to be allied with members appointed by the British administration. As the Palestinians made up the majority of between 80 and 90 percent of the total population in the 1920s, they understandably refused at first to accept the British suggestion of parity, let alone one that disadvantaged them in practice, a position that encouraged the Zionist leaders to endorse it. A pattern now emerges when, in 1928, the Palestinian leadership, apprehensive of the growing Jewish immigration into the country and the expansion of their settlements, agreed to accept the formula as a basis for negotiations. The Zionist leadership quickly rejected it. The Palestinian uprising in 1929 was the direct result of Britain's refusal to implement at least their promise of parity after the Palestinians had been willing to set aside the democratic principle of majoritarian politics, which Britain had championed as the basis for negotiations in all the other Arab states within its sphere of influence. After the 1929 uprising, the Labour government in London appeared inclined to embrace the Palestinian demands. But the Zionist lobby succeeded in reorienting the British government comfortably back onto the Balfourian track. This made another uprising inevitable. It duly erupted in 1936 in the form of a popular rebellion fought with such determination that it forced the British government to station more troops in Palestine than there were in the Indian subcontinent. After three years, with brutal and ruthless attacks on the Palestinian countryside, the British military subdued the revolt. The Palestinian leadership was exiled, and the paramilitary units that had sustained the guerrilla warfare against the mandatory forces were disbanded. During this process, many of the villagers involved were arrested, wounded, or killed. The absence of most of the Palestinian leadership and of viable Palestinian fighting units gave the Jewish forces in 1947 an easy ride into the Palestinian countryside. In between the two uprisings, the Zionist leadership had wasted no time in working out their plans for an exclusively Jewish presence in Palestine. First, in 1937, by accepting a modest portion of the land when they responded favorably to a recommendation, by the British Royal Peel Commission to partition Palestine into two states, and second in 1942 by attempting a more maximalist strategy, demanding all of Palestine for itself. The geographical space it coveted may have changed with time and according to circumstances and opportunities, but the principal objective remained the same. The Zionist project could only be realized through the creation in Palestine of a purely Jewish state, both as a safe haven for Jews from persecution and a cradle for a new Jewish nationalism. And such a state had to be exclusively Jewish, not only in its socio-political structure, but also in its ethnic composition. The next section is titled, Military Preparations. From the outset, the British mandatory authorities have allowed the Zionist movement 
to carve out an independent enclave for itself in Palestine as the infrastructure for a future state. And in the late 1930s, the movement's leaders were able to translate the abstract vision of Jewish exclusivity into more concrete plans. Zionist preparations for the eventuality of taking the land by force, should it fail to be granted to them through diplomacy, included the building of an efficient military organization with the help of sympathetic British officers, and the search for ample financial resources for which they could tap the Jewish diaspora. In many ways, the creation of an embryonic diplomatic corps was also an integral part of the same general preparations that were aimed at snatching, by force, a state in Palestine. It was one British officer in particular, Ord Charles Wingate, who made the Zionist leaders realize more fully that the idea of Jewish statehood had to be closely associated with militarism and an army. First of all, to protect the growing number of Jewish enclaves and colonies inside Palestine, but also more crucially because acts of armed aggression were an effective deterrent against the possible resistance of the local Palestinians. From there, the road to contemplating the enforced transfer of the entire indigenous population would prove to be very short indeed. Ord Wingate was born in India in the early 20th century to a military family and received a very religious upbringing. He began an Arabophile career in the Sudan where he gained prestige with a particularly effective ambush policy against slave traders. In 1936, he was assigned to Palestine where he quickly became enchanted by the Zionist dream. He decided actively to encourage the Jewish settlers and started teaching their troops more effective combat tactics and retaliation methods against the local population. It is no wonder that his Zionist associates greatly admired him. Wingate transformed the principal paramilitary organization of the Jewish community in Palestine, the Haganah. Established in 1920, its name literally means defense in Hebrew, ostensibly to indicate that its main purpose was protecting the Jewish colonies. Under the influence of Wingate and the militant mood he inspired among its commanders, the Haganah quickly became the military arm of the Jewish agency, the Zionist governing body in Palestine that in the end developed and then implemented plans for the Zionist military takeover of Palestine as a whole and the ethnic cleansing of its native population. The Arab revolt gave the Haganah members a chance to practice the military tactics Wingate had taught them in the Palestinian rural areas, mostly in the form of retaliatory operations against such targets as roadside snipers or thieves taking goods from a kibbutz. The main objective, however, seems to have been to intimidate Palestinian communities who happened to live in proximity to Jewish settlements. Wingate succeeded in attaching Haganah troops to the British forces during the Arab Revolt so that they could learn even better what a quote-unquote punitive mission to an Arab village ought to entail. For example, in June 1938, Jewish troops got their first taste of what it meant to occupy a Palestinian village. A Haganah unit and a British company jointly attacked a village on the border between Israel and Lebanon and held it for a few hours. Amat Zia Cohen, who took part in the operation, remembered the British sergeant who showed them how to use bayonets in attacking defenseless villagers. Quote, I think you are all totally ignorant in your Ramat Yochanan, the training base for the Haganah, since you do not even know the elementary use of bayonets when attacking dirty Arabs. How can you put your left foot in front? Unquote. He shouted at Amat Zia and his friends after they had returned to base. Had this sergeant been around in 1948, he would have been proud to see how quickly Jewish troops were mastering the art of attacking villages. The Haganah also gained valuable military experience in the Second World War, when many of its members volunteered for the British war effort. Others who remained behind in Palestine continued to monitor and infiltrate the 1,200 or so Palestinian villages that had dotted the countryside for hundreds of years. The Village Files More was needed than just savoring the excitement of attacking a Palestinian village. Systematic planning was called for. The suggestion came from a young, bespectacled historian from the Hebrew University by the name of Ben Zion Luria, 
at the time an employee of the educational department of the Jewish agency. Luria pointed out how useful it would be to have a detailed registry of all Arab villages and proposed that the Jewish National Fund, or JNF, conduct such an inventory. Quote, this would greatly help the redemption of the land, unquote, he wrote to the JNF. He could not have chosen a better audience. His initiative to involve the JNF in the prospective ethnic cleansing was to generate added impetus and zeal to the expulsion plans that followed. Founded in 1901, the JNF was the principal Zionist tool for the colonization of Palestine. It served as the agency the Zionist movement used to buy Palestinian land upon which it then settled Jewish immigrants. Inaugurated by the Fifth Zionist Congress, it spearheaded the Zionization of Palestine throughout the mandatory years. From the onset, it was designed to become the quote-unquote custodian on behalf of the Jewish people of the land the Zionists gained possession of in Palestine. The JNF maintained this role after the creation of the State of Israel, with other missions being added to its primary role over time. Most of the JNF's activities during the mandatory period and surrounding the Nakba were closely associated with the name of Yosef Weitz, the head of its settlement department. Weitz was the quintessential Zionist colonist. His main priority at the time was facilitating the eviction of Palestinian tenants from land bought from absentee landlords who were likely to live at some distance from their land or even outside the country, the mandate system having created borders where before there were none. Traditionally, when ownership of a plot of land or even a whole village changed hands, this did not mean that the farmers or villagers themselves had to move. Palestine was an agricultural society and the new landlord would need the tenants to continue cultivating his lands. But with the advent of Zionism, all this changed. Weitz personally visited the newly purchased plot of land, often accompanied by his closest aides, and encouraged the new Jewish owners to throw out the local tenants, even if the owner had no use for the entire piece of land. One of Weitz's closest aides, Yosef Nachmani, at one point reported to him that, quote-unquote, unfortunately, tenants refused to leave, and some of the new Jewish landowners displayed, as he put it, quote, cowardice by pondering the option of allowing them to stay." Unquote. It was the job of Nachmani and other aides to make sure that such quote-unquote weaknesses did not persist. Under their supervision, these evictions quickly became more comprehensive and effective. The impact of such activities at the time remained limited because Zionist resources, after all, were scarce, Palestinian resistance fierce, and the British policies restrictive. By the end of the mandate in 1948, the Jewish community owned around 5.8% of the land in Palestine. But the appetite was for more, if only for the available resources to expand and new opportunities open up. This is why Whites waxed lyrical when we heard about the village files, immediately suggesting turning them into a quote-unquote national project. All involved became fervent supporters of the idea. Yitzhak Ben Zvi, a prominent member of the Zionist leadership, a historian and later the second president of Israel, explained in a letter to Moshe Shertok, Sharet, the head of the political department of the Jewish agency, and later one of Israel's prime ministers, that apart from topographically recording the layout of the villages, the project should also include exposing the quote-unquote Hebraic origins of each village. Furthermore, it was important for the Haganah to know which of the villages were relatively new as some of them had been built, quote-unquote, only during the Egyptian occupation of Palestine in the 1830s. The main endeavor, however, was mapping the villages and therefore a topographer from the Hebrew University working in the mandatory cartography department was recruited to the enterprise. He suggested conducting an aerial photographic survey and proudly showed Ben-Gurion two such aerial maps for the villages of Sindiana and Sabarin. These maps, now in the Israeli State Archives, are all that remains of these villages after 1948. The best professional photographers in the country were now invited to join the initiative. Yitzhak Shefer from Tel Aviv and Margot Sade, the wife of Yitzhak Sade the chief of the Palmach, 
commando units of the Haganah, were recruited too. The film laboratory operated in Margot's house with an irrigation company serving as a front. The lab had to be hidden from the British authorities who could have regarded it as an illegal intelligence effort directed against them. The British did have prior knowledge of it, but never succeeded in spotting the secret hideout. In 1947, this whole cartographic department was moved to the Red House. The end results of both the topographic and orientalist efforts were the detailed files the Zionist experts gradually built up for each of Palestine's villages. By the late 1930s, this quote-unquote archive was almost complete. Precise details were recorded about the topographic location of each village, its access roads, quality of land, water springs, main sources of income, its socio-political composition, religious affiliations, names of its muktars, its relationship with other villages, the age of individual men, 16 to 50, and many more. An important category was an index of quote-unquote hostility, towards the Zionist project, that is, decided by the level of the village's participation in the revolt of 1936. There was a list of everyone who had been involved in the revolt and the families of those who had lost someone in the fight against the British. Particular attention was given to people who had allegedly killed Jews. As we shall see, in 1948, these last bits of information fueled the worst atrocities in the villages, leading to mass executions and torture. Regular members of the Haganah who were entrusted with collecting the data on quote-unquote reconnaissance journeys into these villages realized from the start that this was not a mere academic exercise in geography. One of these was Moshe Pasternak, who joined one of the early excursions and data collection operations in 1940. He recalled many years later, quote, We had to study the basic structure of the Arab village. This means the structure and how best to attack it. In the military schools, I had been taught how to attack a modern European city, not a primitive village in the Near East. We could not compare it, an Arab village, to a Polish or an Austrian one. The Arab village, unlike the European ones, was built topographically on hills. That meant we had to find out how best to approach the village from above, or enter it from below. We had to train our quote-unquote Arabists, the Orientalists who operated a network of collaborators, how best to work with informants. Indeed, the problem noted in many of the village's files was how to create a collaborationist system with the people Pasternak and his friends regarded as primitive and barbaric. Quote, people who like to drink coffee and eat rice with their hands, which made it very difficult to use them as informants, unquote. In 1943, he remembered, there was a growing sense that finally they had a proper network of informants in place. That same year, the village files were rearranged to become even more systematic. This was mainly the work of one man, Ezra Danin, who would play a leading role in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. In many ways, it was the recruitment of Ezra Danin who had been taken out of his successful citrus grove business that injected the intelligence work and the organization of the village files with a new level of efficiency. Files in the post-1943 era included detailed descriptions of the husbandry, the cultivated land, the number of trees and plantations, the quality of each fruit grove, even of each single tree, the average amount of land per family, the number of cars, shop owners, members of workshops, and the names of the artisans in each village and their skills. Later, meticulous detail was added about each clan and its political affiliation, the social stratification between notables and common peasants, and the names of the civil servants in the mandatory government. And as the data collection created its own momentum, one finds additional details popping up around 1945, such as descriptions of village mosques and the names of their imams, together with such characterizations as, quote, he is an ordinary man, unquote, and even precise accounts of the living rooms inside the homes of these dignitaries. Towards the end of the mandatory period, the information becomes more explicitly militarily orientated. The number of guards, most villages had none, and the quantity and quality of the arms at the villagers' disposal, generally antiquated or even non-existent. In 
I'm going to call it here. Apparently, I started reading not knowing that it was going to be a longer chapter, and it's about an hour long, so I'm going to split it into a part one and a part two. I will edit the front also so that it's a two-parter. Um, but this is the end of part one of chapter two of Ilan Pape's The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, written 2006 and seven, and read 2024. Stay tuned for part two. I've already got it recorded, just need to go through and edit it.